Good evening. Oh, you can hear me now. How are you guys? Um, I'm Dave Lennox. I'm the university architect and director of campus planning here at Stanford. And I want to welcome you to the second lecture in our 2015 architecture and landscape architecture series. And please silence your phones. That's OK. That's OK. Can't take you anywhere. <laughs> So last year, our lecturers investigated the theme of origins. And this year, the theme is the moment. Architecture today doesn't seem to have a clearly definable formal movement, or at least no architect will typically admit to it. Some architects have strove to understand the past and our traditions. Some have endeavored to capture the spirit of the age, zeitgeist. And others have speculatively attempted to create the architecture of the future. So. We have asked this year's lecturers to simply explain what is your architecture of the moment. I want to thank uh, Nichelle Hagen and Zach Posner uh, for helping, uh, they're from our office, for helping to organize uh, the lecture series, as well as John Barton, who's a director of the architectural program here at Stanford. And we're really privileged to have such outstanding speakers this spring. I'd also like to thank the American Institute of Architects, the Santa Clara Valley chapter, for their help in advertising the series as well as helping to coordinate the continuing professional, professional education. And if you desire, you can sign the clipboard in the lobby. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Stanley Sadowitz. It's almost like I don't have to read this now, right? You can <laughs> get up and talk. Uh, Mr. Sadowitz was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, and received his Bachelor of Architecture at the University of Witterstrand in 1974 and his Master's of Architecture at the University of California in Berkeley in 77. He is Emeritus Professor of Architecture at the University of California, Berkeley, and has taught at numerous schools, including Harvard, University of Norman, Oklahoma, UCLA, Rice, SciArc, Cornell, Syracuse, and the University of Texas at Austin. He's given more than 200 lectures uh, in the United States and abroad. His first house was built in uh, 1975, and together with Stanley Sadowitz, Natoma Architects, Inc., has completed numerous residential, commercial, and institutional projects. He has designed houses and housing, master plans, offices, museums, libraries, wineries, synagogues, churches, commercial and residential interiors, memorials, urban landscapes, and promenades. Lots of work. Among the many national and international awards, the Transvaal House was declared a national monument by the Monuments Council in South Africa in 1997. And the New England Holocaust Memorial received the Henry Bacon Medal in 1998. And in 2006, he was a finalist for the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt National Design Award given by Laura Bush at the White House. Uh, three books have been published on his work. And numerous articles, of course, have been published in books and magazines and newspapers. So please, he spoke here before. So please give another warm Stanford welcome to Stanley Sadowitz. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Architecture's central project is the building of the city. This is an ancient process which has been in progress for millennia. Each contributing part must be more than itself, charging the spaces around, making connections, adding to the whole. Urban buildings which participate in this tradition are antidotes to the expressionism of so much current production claiming to be architecture. Rather than self-expression, they focus on collective form. Rather than plastic configurations of voluntary fantasy, the goal is the continuity of the city. The urban environment is not a series of independent staccato objects floating in a field, but a historic process of continuous evolution and development. The forms of urban <coughs> architecture are ancient, regular, simple, and present a unified view. They've remained constant for millennia and are still actively evolving in our electronic present. 
The most obvious unit is the cube or rectangular block. This, coupled with the grid as a method of placement, are universal ways of forming cities. Cube and grid have the look of openness, expendability, repeatability, equanimity, directness, and publicness. They emerge from clear thought and intention rather than groping expression. They are broad-based cultural infrastructures found throughout time and place. There are 197,000 building parcels in San Francisco. 173,000, or 87.8%, .8 are residential. Housing is by far the most important constituent element of the fabric of the city, the prime ingredient of its urban grain. San Francisco used to be made up of a variety of neighborhoods, neighborhood architectures, which led to a rich urban fabric. This is rapidly vanishing. My work is a search to reinvigorate the unique characteristics of each site. These three new Victorians on Natoma Street have been the laboratory of our urban buildings. 1022, our office on the right, 1028 next door, and 1029 across the street. A few blocks away, the Soma Jack and Jill is reinterpreted as 1234 Howard Street. The crenellated texture of typical San Francisco streetscapes is transformed to a new scale at 855 Folsom Street. At 555 Golden Gate, next to the new PUC building, a white San Francisco high-rise with a garden at grade to commemorate Stars, the famous restaurant that once occupied the site. Amongst the wedding cake fabric of the Van Ness Corridor, 1080 Sutter continues the grain. On Clara, a Soma Alley, a building which bends to let southern light penetrate. In Dogpatch, with its big industrial fabric, a small building of pleated bays, both singular and differentiated, which looks away from, the th from Third Street and opens to the bay. In the mission, completing a corner, with the prescribed rear yard incised on the perimeter as a series of courts which increase light exposure. On Polk Street, punctured windows become projecting balconies. This urban fabric type, sometimes warehouse, sometimes factory, sometimes loft, now mostly tech startup, is modernized using the same pragmatic structural principles with contemporary materials and means. On Mission Street, shielding views and sounds from the freeway. In Oakland, a roundabout resolving the radiating avenues in a big O. In Toronto, a modern city of glass towers. The tropical modernism of Miami Beach reinvigorated on two blocks for waves at 600 Alton Road with an outdoor shopping court within. <coughs> Pacific City in Huntington Beach, a seaside town based on ocean Mediterranean instead of the ubiquitous mission style red tile roofs which originate on the, in the hills which are the sort of legislated style of um, Huntington Beach. But um, through an education process, I actually got this project entitled through the various uh, bodies by explaining what ocean Mediterranean actually is. This is how we deal with the exteriors of our buildings, where the skin weaves the interior with a specific climate and particular culture of the city. Our interiors 
emerge from another set of questions. Many architects are interested in freedom of expression and design buildings as personal statements. My interest is rather in the freedom of expression of the occupants, in providing opportunities for the people who inhabit buildings. This calls for forms that are open-ended and ambiguous, abstract and free of agenda, that express their own reality rather than artistic impulse. I'm interested in perceptible process, which is captured in the object and remains part of its experience, like forms in nature. Architecture has legible intention, articulated in the accumulated language of form. This is sometimes structural, sometimes material, and always spatial. In the search for the authentic over the image, the actual materials and the systems of assembly, the processes of construction, become the expression. I always see buildings as instruments more than objects, as receptacles for changing events in time rather than static monuments in space. I aim to make buildings that facilitate occupancy and appropriation, buildings which are frames rather than pictures, more like a telephone than a conversation, more like a camera than a photograph. Our work emerges from highly modulated and systematic plans assembled from a catalogue of ideal contemporary types which are constantly evolving. We use the lessons of mass production, and although there are claims that current technologies will bypass the need for repetition, we've employed the economies of serialization to increase quality. We've never had any interest in arbitrary variety, preferring to make all units the same and good, and when inhabited, the neutral spaces we provide result in much more differentiation than I could ever imagine. In order to provide the maximum indeterminate deprogrammed space, the service elements, kitchens, bathrooms, storage, are accumulated, collapsed, and minimized. These servant programs are compressed, eliminating the whole idea of rooms, replacing them with minimally differentiated continuous fields of space. The service elements double as structure and stack vertically. All mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and sprinkler runs chase within these zones. All lighting emanate from these dense areas. This process of reduction, compression, and repetition provides opportunities for the expansion and the reallocation of resources to increase qualities in other elements. Through hierarchical unities, elements are assembled, grouped, and minimized, providing the maximum amount of free space for occupants to determine their own programs. Buildings become instruments to facilitate, rather than objects to admire. They exist in the dimension of time as much as the measure of space. From this strategi strategy, we've developed two typical plan types, which we're using in many of our projects today. The first um, are what we call thickened walls, and the second pods. These are uh, some examples of thickened walls where all the mechanics and program have been collapsed into here a four-foot zone, here an eight-foot zone, and here another eight-foot zone, leaving a free space which can be uh, carved in a sort of um, indeterminate way um, through the process. So here you see the operation of this strategy where all the mechanics are in this zone, leaving this zone entirely free, and um, where uh, the program is sort of <coughs> determined by the placing of furniture. This is another example of the same idea of uh, a thickened wall, and here the sort of idea of buildings that exist in the dimension of time where a master bedroom now becomes connected almost in a loft-like way with the rest of the apartment through the sliding of these um, simple patio doors. And here are the bathroom elements. Another example of um, this idea of thickened wall and, and free space um, in an eight-foot dimension with kitchen, 
um, washer dryer, uh, closet and bathroom. And um, another example of a similar type of space. This is a, a series of examples of how the pod idea has been interpreted. So here you see on the one side of a pod floating in a field of space, a kitchen, and on the other side, um, a bathroom, which um, looks like this inside of it. Here, a pod, which is a single element of furniture, which is the entire sort of mechanism of domestic life, um, a kitchen, storage, and a bathroom. And the location of this pod in this field of space then creates opportunities for program like a bedroom, a dining room, and a living room. And these, um, we're actually experimenting now in Cleveland with um, pre-manufacturing and slipping into a building like a piece of furniture. This is the bathroom side where the splash of the kitchen is glass, so you're getting daylight um, into this, which is often in dense housing conditions, a dark sort of element. And here you can see the same pod idea in a project in San Francisco. Um, and here the sort of opening of this field of space into a single uh, kind of uh, loft or the shutting down into a two-bedroom apartment. And again, the opening and closing of this. This is standing inside the bathroom area of the pod, closing the door and someone walks by in the bedroom here the bathroom opens and the accessible sort of part of the bathroom is shared. Um, the, the turning radius of, 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 of the accessible part of the bathroom is also a passage and then um, closing it again. Um, so with that as the sort of um, background of the work, I wanted to show you a few specific projects um, f from uh, recent work. This is um, 8 Octavia which is at a really um, interesting moment of arrival in San Francisco. This is where the 101 um, ends and becomes part of the city grid. This is Octavia Boulevard. And um, so this city is in a, w this um, project is in a way a gateway, um, an entry point to the city. And it was important uh, for me to think about the way this could introduce people to the San Francisco of, of today, the San Francisco that's more about the iPhone than the Victorian. Um, and so the building is actually essentially an instrument where the facade is a constantly evolving billboard that is controlled by the occupants who live here, who determine their relationship to the outside by operating these louvers. So this is the sort of old San Francisco, the, the sort of San Francisco of image. And this is um, an extraction of that idea into a new San Francisco, which is a San Francisco um, a, where a building is actually an instrument. And here you see the old Victorian San Francisco and the new Victorian San Francisco and the new gateway to the city. And the way that the sort of very fine grain of the city and this quite feminine texture of uh, Victorian architecture gets um, sort of reinterpreted in, in, in the, a new scale of development that's more about our present. This is the operation um, of the life inside these units where with this Western exposure you can control the amount of sunlight penetration and actually also the sound from this very heavily trafficked boulevard. And just some views of the building um, as it sort of appears in the city. The ground floor, which is all dedicated to commercial use and the entry to the building um, off Market Street and the lobby. One of the requirements of buildings in San Francisco is what's called a rear yard. And the uh, requirement by the zoning is that 25% of the lot has to be left open. So what we negotiated in this particular case was to split that 25% into four vertical rear yards, which penetrate through the building. You can see them appearing on the facade and then cut through or cut through and then dropping back. 
And these vertical rear yards then um, give access to light and air so that the sort of girth of the face of the building has been expanded to um, produce opportunities that are more extended uh, for light. And this is the sort of experience of arriving at your home. So unlike most urban apartment buildings where you arrive home in a double loaded corridor and open a door into your unit, here you actually arrive through one of these uh, sort of communal spaces that um, bring a, a kind of sense of neighborliness together, almost like the backyards of, of the traditional San Francisco um, neighborhoods. S so that they act as a kind of community um, condenser in many ways. I live in a building actually that has spaces like this and it's been very surprising because I've become friends with my neighbors, which never happened to me in cities before. Um, so uh, this is uh, the sort of arrival at your apartment. And this is just the organization of the building, um, which is on this very steep um, slope. This is the parking which is carved into the hill. And then the building um, as you arrive in the hallways and the sort of um, structuring of the building with these L-shaped units and I-shaped units. Um, this the thickened wall type, this the pod type. And the way that then these wrap around these courtyards and then flip-flop to create a um, series of sort of outdoor spaces, rooftops, and a, a kind of more complex idea of a, a vertical yard. And then uh, again, flip-flop again, and then end up on the roof. Um, so these are those slits that uh, are the rear yard that are folded through the building. This is a typical two-bedroom unit with this whole set of mechanisms compacted into the most um, sort of finite zone and this being a much more open-ended and, and um, interpretable um, area of space. And um, that's the presence of that unit, um, the dining area, the kitchen, the thickened wall with um, bathroom and storage and then the way that this wall operates as a sort of machine to become an instrument. Here the pod element, and um, here you see the, the pod, um, which is um, conceived as a piece of furniture, but was actually site um, constructed in this particular case. And um, the way that it, it, it appears from the bedroom side, these are just some of the other units. And at the top of the building, these um, three uh, story units which take the two building blocks of the L and the I and, and unify them into um, a, a sort of great room, a master suite, and then the standard two bedrooms and have their own rooftop access through these spiral stairs. This is one of those units. It's a 54 foot long room and uh, the master bedroom where the bed would go over here with the bathroom arrayed behind the, this glass screen and um, the, the uh, dressing area over there. This is a site um, in the Civic Center area of San Francisco, which is probably the most sort of architectural um, moment of the city where all these beautiful Beaux-Arts buildings cluster around a park. And um, so quite a sort of challenging opportunity to build um, in the presence of such uh, sort of uh, strong architectural influence. And uh, one of the sort of um, early observations was that all of these buildings are actually arranged around quite strong um, central uh, courts. So I decided to use the same organizational um, device for my building and um, because again there's this requirement of a rear yard um, this is essentially the rear yard of the building which is open to the sky and which the building is organized around so this is the plan of city hall and then this is the plan of um, my project at, at uh, ground level with uh, a cross axis and a series of um, commercial spaces the dome of city hall and the sort of um, rear yard of my building where this is the uh, access 
corridors to the units themselves and it's open to the sky. This is the parking, again the retail space. The way the um, units, which are these pod units, are arranged around the, the hallway and um, then the rooftop and the section. So here you see the building in relation to its context, these um, heavily rusticated plinths that are reimagined in this building, these beautifully articulated corners, which um, again, I've learned the lessons from the um, cornices and very elaborate tops, which are um, again reinterpreted in my project. So um, a very sort of cautious and careful analysis of all the elements of these buildings to try to um, create something which is both of our time and respectful of the world that it finds itself in. This is um, the symphony building with its um, piano keyboard on the facade. And uh, again, the idea of a building like this is that it connects to its context, both old and new, and marks its presence and the uh, moment when it joins the Department of Public Health building. Um, and the entry into the um, void at the center, the rear yard, and the life of that rear yard, and um, the, w the sort of experience of living in this um, void, and um, the view from the building back into the bizarre world. In Berkeley, um, this is a project for um, student housing. And um, Berkeley's a very interesting fabric, which is essentially made up of what were originally detached homes and have now become subdivided and very densely inhabited. But um, the infill that happened in Berkeley has mostly disregarded this texture of buildings in a garden and often created these very large objects which are very disruptive to the overall fabric of the town. So my approach was instead to do what um, we ended up calling the garden village, which is a, a kind of series of buildings that are linked by outdoor space in a kind of um, green um, continuous setting. This is actually a pre-manufactured modular project and, and believe it or not it's actually being made I'll show you but because um, I know these things have been dreams for the last hundred years but actually we are doing this so there are two modules um, this is the a module which is basically living room um, dining room kitchen and then this is the B module this is how the a module looks this is the B module which is uh, a bathroom and two bedrooms so the standard um, kind of four-bedroom student unit um, is a, a, an accumulation of one A module and two B modules, which are slid together and then um, stacked on top of each other and then stacked around the site. Um, and then we also have some more luxurious units, which are basically um, two-bedroom units which are one of the A modules and one of the B modules which are then put together and um, then uh, stacked in the same way and fill out the rest of the site. Um, then there's a sort of independent um, walkway system which links all of these little towers together and is basically made out of bar grating. And um, here you see the site plan so that you see how the texture of Berkeley is maintained um, and the kind of openness and the idea of uh, a sort of village where um, it serves two purposes. The one is to provide enough exterior girth to have light for all these bedrooms which student housing demands and the other is to create um, buffers for sound and also um, to create this sense of living in a village. And so these are the plans as you go up. This is the texture of um, Garden Village and the texture of Berkeley so that it's quite continuous with the, the fabric of the town and just some views of it um, as you drive up Dwight and as you come down Fulton Street 
and um, just the sort of uh, idea of these um, open walkways, which are the access to the towers of, of student houses and the character of this village, um, which uh, have these green spaces and, and um, sort of uh, connective tissue for student life. This is a rooftop uh, outdoor area, which is a common area for the project, and one of the gardens, and um, just again views um, of the street. This is the factory in uh, Lathrop where the modules are being made, and it's a wonderful process actually because unlike construction, um, this is a, a, a manufactured product, so all the, there's no dirt and waste and um, the labor that actually produces these buildings doesn't necessarily have to be um, skilled construction workers. The, the workers are, are essentially um, people who, who are, are, are know how to make things. So it's a, a manufacturing process versus a construction process. I mean, it's, it's sort of cleaner than the garage where I take my car. Um, and, and so th this is actually how these things are being made. And um, they, they, it's quite interesting how the modules are done because one of the difficulties that we have in the, in the Bay Area is that we're always fighting height because there's some sort of penal idea about building tall buildings. I'm not sure where it comes from, but I think it's a fear of Manhattan. So we had to actually produce these without duplicating. A lot of these pre-manufactured modules actually duplicate the floors um, so that you create a complete, almost like shipping container and drop one on the other. We developed a system where we didn't need to do that. So these are shipped um, as you see them here. And um, here you see them arriving on the site. This is a, a prototype that we built um, in Oakland to test the, the, the sort of difficulties that there are many of, of building buildings with very large pieces like this. And um, so here you see the modules being stacked and um, here you see the building finished. It's, it's five units um, of this type. This is the way the modules arrive from the factory. Um, all you need to do is go to the grocery store and stock up the fridge and you're ready to go. Um, or just put uh, uh, your towels on. Um, the tiling, everything's done in the factory and, and it's really nice quality as well. So it's quite an amazing operation. Um, and so here we are at Dwight, the site's been demolished, the basement, which is for the mechanical systems is under construction and the modules are being produced in the factory and will arrive soon. Um, up the street in Berkeley, I'm working on a project um, next to the University Art Museum, sorry, um, on this site over here. Again, student housing and um, the, the sort of um, main public gesture is this porch which uh, is a sort of semi-public element. There's a lounge for the students and a, a, a management office and um, this is the unit types which are essentially pod units but they'll be built um, on site and um, these are thickened wall units and these are the different, huh? these are different unit types. Um, that, that are in that project. Um, I don't know why this thing's going black. Does anyone know how to, th th this, these slides aren't showing for some reason. Um, this is uptown in Cleveland which is essentially a new neighborhood that um, we've been working on for Case University. Um, when we started, this was all parking lots and pretty much uh, almost like a Detroit kind of site. And this is phase one, which were the first two buildings that we completed. This is phase two, which is now done. Th this is phase three, which is in progress. And we've just been given um, phase four to do, which is going to be a high rise on this site. The concept for the project was pretty much the idea of inventing uh, an urban architecture which would create a kind of district architecture that was modeled on 
um, these great cities like Paris and London. And Cleveland itself has a very beautiful historic fabric of these perforated wall um, buildings that were sort of the equivalent of the Chicago buildings, just really fine um, buildings. So we began with a kind of analysis of um, the fabric of the downtown architecture and also the neighborhood architecture that's in the sort of direct area of our site and eventually developed a language for um, the exteriors of our buildings which you see over here which is a combination of a, an idea about a townhouse and a continuous fabric building. So this is the sort of um, result of uh, the, the architectural language that we invented and the way that the language is a continuation and interpretation of the historic condition. This is the kind of threading of existing fabric together, um, existing street structure. This is a case um, dormitory that uh, we embraced in our project and created an alleyway which is now all um, food and beverage. And um, this is the Cleveland Institute of Art, which I'll show you later, and MOCA, which are two new institutions that were built um, at the same time as our project. The project is based on uh, a sort of thickened wall idea with these continuous um, service zones and uh, a double loaded corridor, and then these continuous free zones, which um, are carved up in different ways. This building carved into smaller um, units to house mainly a student population and this building more market rate um, population for Case University. These are for um, Cleveland Clinic. These are the um, different unit types but there um, are quite a few more but I mean it just shows you the general strategy and I'll show you more about that. So this is then the sort of threading and weaving of existing and new and um, the sort of creation of this town, uptown. Um, this is phase two now. The success of phase one gave everyone confidence to double the scale in phase two, and phase three and four will be even bigger. So I was sort of stuck with a difficult problem because I'd already built these buildings and I had to kind of figure out a way to both um, double them and continue them. So this is the result of, of um, that. Um, this building's program is essentially um, student housing for Cleveland Institute of Art and then market rate housing. So it's got a mixed interior, but it's, it operates as two separate buildings, um, essentially, all residential. So this is just some of the texture of this new town. This is the alley, the um, entry to the student um, housing, the entry to the market rate housing. Um, the market rate housing over here. And uh, this sort of um, concept of um, gateways which um, connect through, we also made a hole in this existing building to connect to this parking lot and this courtyard behind here. So this threads through from um, our building to uh, the rear yard and uh, a residential neighborhood. Um, this is a link between the two art institutions and, and so on. So these were the key things, this sort of urban idea. The whole ground of the building is um, both transparent but also um, glass so that it uh, creates a sort of sense of floating open publicness. Um, and then there are the, the gateways which um, do actually link through um, in various sort of places. These are semi-public areas in the buildings themselves, which are sort of eyes on the street as well as gathering places. Um, I'll show you something of them. Um, one of the interesting things about this project is this material and this material are both exactly the same and the identical color. They're a, a aluminum, um, custom aluminum ribbed extrusion. And because one is horizontal and the other vertical, the way the light hits them, um, creates this difference. Um, this is a sort of typical um, common area where the elevators um, connect to a, a collective space which is volumetric and where all the units kind of um, lead from. And there are th three or four spaces in each of the building 
that allow for this sort of intermediate type of gathering. This is a smaller one. Um, these are the hallways with the entries to the units themselves. These are the units which are essentially um, the thickened wall project with um, a, a light. You can see there's almost nothing in this part of the unit. The, the, all the lighting, air handling, and mechanics are in these zones. And it's quite an economical way to build apart from it being a spatial uh, beneficial way to build because um, you can see there's a soffit here so everything gets chased around in the soffit and nothing has to, th this is just the structural concrete which gets exposed as the finished ceiling. These are actually the highest renting apartments in uh, Cleveland strangely enough even though they were designed to be something else but um, people have quite enjoyed them. Um, this is a two-bedroom unit where there are floor-to-ceiling sliding doors, so you can have a sort of roommate or, uh, you know, like a family situation. And the bathrooms where th these um, etched glass doors get borrowed light from the main space and illuminate those spaces. So here you see, again, the elements of the language, the horizontal ribbing, the vertical ribbing, the sun shades on the southern exposure. And... Um, the sort of architecture of density that results from that patterning. Um, this is the CIA building, which was built after our building was finished, and where you can see the workings of this sort of neighborhood language that, w that they actually picked up on. It's a, it's a local corporate firm that did this building, but I, I was really thrilled that they um, actually did understand the, the quality of sort of building a neighborhood and, and used it for their institutional building. In Los Angeles, the city of gridded freeways and gridded um, roads, and a city which is historically horizontal, um, we're working on a pair of towers in Hollywood. So the establishment of a language for the towers that's consistent with the sort of images of Los Angeles was to flip this grid vertically and make the streets into structure and the yards into balconies. And so this is the kind of um, building block of the Palladium project. The project actually um, occupies the parking lot of this historic building and part of our project is to landmark this building, which is a place where Frank Sinatra first sang and things like that. So it's qu quite a legendary presence in Hollywood. And um, so we did a kind of analysis of the language of the Palladium as well to develop our architecture. And this kind of deco curvilinearity became the sort of inspiration for the soft forms of our building. This marquee, which is quite sort of iconic and and historic um, is also reflected. So here you see the sort of construction of an urban precinct in a parking lot. So this building today floats with cars all around it. And this is a sort of creation of a precinct for it with a courtyard, um, another courtyard, and the entries and a major sort of automotive arrival point um, around the existing canopy. Um, oops. Oh, no, that's, that's not one altogether. So these are just some of the images. I mean, this is, again, the same strategy of these thickened walls and the different um, unit types. And just some images of this um, latticework of uh, balconies and screening that um, becomes the front of the building. And uh, views of the old and new and um, the sort of recreation of a more intense kind of dense urban life that will reinvigorate what's a little seedy right now um, as, it, as, as it is today. This is Chicago and working in Chicago is an amazing opportunity because it's the city where um, modernism was actually invented and it's almost like what Florence is for the Renaissance, Chicago is for modernism and it's this city of 
grids both horizontally and vertically and where the frame was uh, first developed as a sort of pragmatic way to stack things but later by people like Mies was turned into a form of architectural expression and a language and um, so the idea for the building was really a palm cyst to create a, an object which would somehow collapse all of this history into a single building. So this was sort of the operation of building this building out of the sort of history and lessons of Chicago. And here you see the building, it's in the corner of Roosevelt in Michigan, in south side um, opposite uh, end of Grant Park and a kind of bookend to this uh, amazing sort of open space. One of the uh, sort of interests that I had very early on in Chicago after looking at Aqua with these very nice sort of Miami type of balconies that are like just thrown out into the wind was to make a building that would actually um, be able to be used in that climate. So all of the balconies are actually incised deep into what I described. This is just showing the sort of texture of the building and in its context and how it absorbs the fabric of the building. But the balconies are all cut deep into the building um, as a kind of inverted radiator so that they are out of the wind and also bring light deep into the plan. So, so it's kind of a way that I think it might be possible to use these spaces and it certainly makes these spaces valuable in terms of um, pulling light in. Um, so uh, this is just uh, the entry to the building where um, you walk into uh, a, a sort of vertical lake and walk through the lake um, to a, a massive amenity zone which is almost like a resort where um, point. Here you see all of the uh, vertical distribution of the building, the elevators and stairs. This is all the wet services of the building. Um, this is all the indeterminate <laughs> space of the building and these are the recessed balconies. So it's very rigorously based on the same traditions and here you see the way the system actually works to um, make decisions about different types of units. So one of the things that's always difficult with development is finding the right mix and often it has to get uh, deferred quite late in the project. So this method of um, system sort of uh, rigor allows that to be done late in the game. And um, this is just some views of the building. I wanted to show um, a few of the other project types that um, we're working on. And like most small offices, we began with single family houses. And it's something that we still um, are engaged in. And um, uh, this is a house in San El Somo from uh, f for one of the people from Apple. It was a really um, complicated site with um, all sloping sort of areas right at the end of the development of Sleepy Hollow. And um, the only way that it seemed feasible to build on a site like this was actually to create uh, our own site. So we built a bridge which um, contains the program of the house and on the lower level it's all the bedrooms and then on the upper level it's um, a big sort of loft like um, family and formal house, a guest house and garage. And um, the site itself is um, quite intricate and there are two sort of scales, the village kind of scale of Sleepy Hollow and then a big public land area. So the, the section actually accommodates and opens up to those places. So this is the bridge spanning across and creating a new kind of landscape for the house to um, occupy. This is the arrival into a courtyard 
which um, then leads to the front door and another courtyard which leads out at the other end to a swimming pool. So all of the sort of outdoor areas also had to be made as part of the landscape. And here you see the bridge um, in its landscape with a creek running below it. This is the interior, um, very sort of light filled and um, this side all glass and then the, the lower area all glass for the sleeping areas. And everything is sort of bridging and floating all through the house. This is a house in Costa Rica, which is uh, basically a vacation house. And when the occupants are in San Francisco, the house has to be shut down and secured um, very rigorously. So this is how it is then. It's in a beautiful uh, kind of jungle with wild fruit trees and monkeys swinging around and it's, 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 it's actually like a paradise. Um, the house itself doesn't have any glazing. This is all just fly screens and when the, when the occupants are there these screens are all opened up. When they leave it's all shut down. But this is it inside the jungle when they arrive and then when it's opened up and when it's opened up it's completely open to the landscape. And um, there's a very sort of interesting, different kind of technology that gets used to build there of masonry and concrete, which I very much enjoyed um, working with, as well as the steel fabricating, which was part of a tradition that I saw all over in San Jose. This is a house under construction in Atherton. Um, it's a 17,000 square foot house for some um, very low number Google uh, people. Um, and um, the, ones, the, the sort of part that connects to the cul-de-sac, which is a rival, is all pretty uh, solid. And then uh, the views and the rest of the house is all entirely glass and opens up. It's quite a beautiful site with um, amazing sort of views of San Francisco and it's basically oriented and pointed. This is the arrival and then all of the open part which looks at the views and it stacks in the landscape like that. Um, these are the sort of main program elements, the garage, pool and pool house and just some views of the building. Um, it's all poured in place concrete uh, and, and glass and steel. And this is the kind of mock-up of the concrete which we have real concrete artists working with us. This is actually the construction. This is a synagogue um, in San Francisco and um, it's a synagogue for a, a conservative congregation and the most important aspect of conservative Judaism is that they've integrated the, uh, the services for men and women. Traditionally, women didn't participate in the services and the whole evolution of this design actually emerged from that fact. Um, being in a city, um, the sort of arrival and the transition into the building becomes very important. So it's pretty much um, cut off and a series of courts that bring you to the worship space, which is a way of sort of moving from the everyday to the more sacred. The exterior and the imagery is a memory of the most holy place for um, Jews, which is the, the, the Western Wall in Jerusalem. And this is the arrival into a, a courtyard, up a staircase, um, where you look back at the city and arrive in yet another courtyard, which links the social hall, a school, and the sanctuary itself. And um, the, the sort of origins of and, and beginning of thought for this building is actually from Masada, which was um, the first, um, oh, this is the most ancient synagogue, which is based on a Roman kind of format. And I, I use this as the sort of starting point for the design. And so this is this bowl where um, traditionally women worshippers were in balconies and cut off, but here everyone's in this sort of single um, space 
uh, which is all focused on the center, which is where the service is conducted. So it's very much like the small ancient synagogues. So this is the space itself. And it's quite an amazing experience when it's full of people because it's just sort of a sea of faces that uh, decorate these walls. One of the sort of interesting aspects of um, Judaism is that ornament is forbidden. It's basically... Um, considered idolatry. So the way that the space is actually decorated is with light. And this is a menorah which casts shadows so that during the day as you sit in the services, there's a sort of constant um, array of changing light that, that um, animates the space. All of the actual connections between the elements of the building are also made with light so that things float in this kind of ephemeral space. Um, this is a, a, the daily chapel, which was actually made by the salvaged um, stained glass from the previous synagogue that we demolished to build this building. And um, the meditation space in a garden, um, and uh, again, the courtyard, the social hall, uh, and um, leaving the building and the building is part of the city. This is um, Drexel University in Philadelphia, where I'm working on a project for, called the Center for Jewish Life. It's in a neighborhood context like this, and this is the building. You can see that there's a very rich tradition of um, brick buildings that it's part of. Um, the building's organized um, on the site by uh, uh, the sort of basement being uh, um, a zone of support. Then the main floor, which is the sort of community floor, which is where all the meeting occurs. The next floor being a floor of teaching. And then the top being a, a worship space uh, floor with all the different sanctuaries. So this is the support, the kitchen and um, storage, the communal space at the center with uh, a lounge, um, an amphitheater, and a dining space. And um, then uh, the learning areas, which are classrooms, offices, and um, meeting rooms. And then three different synagogue spaces, one for conservative, one for orthodox, and one for reform. Judaism split into many branches these days. Um, and all of them um, have very distinct differences. So my interest was in actually creating a space which would unify all of these people, which is this space here, which I'll show you later. So here's a section. The image of the building, I wanted to evoke one of the... Uh, Judaism's a religion of a paucity of imagery, but we do have a few things, and one of them is this, and another is this. So that the facade of the building evokes some of those images and also uses the brickwork that's so much part of the, this um, neighborhood in Philadelphia. So that it's almost like brick turned into fabric that's kind of draped over the um, spaces within. It's also very much about making these sort of transitional spaces and connections between the sort of every day of student life in the interior and also about welcoming and inviting everyone to be part of the building. This is just a view. Drexel's a sort of interesting campus which is basically taking over the fabric of uh, original um, Philadelphia residential neighborhood. And, and so it's, it's quite mixed at the moment. This is the lounge when you arrive. Um, this is a kind of meeting space, common space, staircase, courtyard that leads up from the community to the learning area. And um, this space has many uses. It can be a movie theater. It can be a synagogue um, on the high holidays. And, um, and then the dining space, one of the synagogues, and the sort of central space, which is in a way a deconstructed or absent synagogue that unites the three different denominations into this sort of common area. Um, which, which none of them can possess. In um, San Francisco, we're working with 
PG&E to do a series of new substations. These old substations were basically air-cooled and massive, and the new substations are um, gas-cooled and, and have the same sort of capacity but are extremely miniature. So what we managed to persuade PG&E to do was to push them back from the main streets and create public plazas. And um, so this, this actually has the same electrical output, actually more electrical output than this, but they'll both uh, coexist on the site. This is another site in Potrero where we're doing the same thing in this area here. So this is all an old air-cooled um, substation, and then the new um, gas-cooled substation is over here. So what we did was um, basically create a, a kind of kit of parts to wrap these substations and also to create the plazas. So there are essentially five precast elements which are unique pieces which then can be combined in 20 um, different derivations and then are used to wrap the facades and then tra transform into a kind of habitable um, ground surfaces and, and furniture. And the two sites have very different conditions. The one's in the downtown with high rises all around. The other is in um, the Potrero district near the bay. So we used the same elements vertically in the downtown and then horizontally at the water. And so this is the Embarcadero site, which has visibility from all the high rises beyond. So there's a green roof, there's um, the plaza, and then the facade. And so th these are the elements that wrap this building and the relationship to the existing building. And we are doing, PG&E has plenty of electricity, but <laughs> this, is, this is LED. Um, and so this is just the, the sort of plazas that will be created by these buildings. And in Potrera, it's the same idea, but horizontal. And um, so here you see um, the same array of elements being used. It's a bigger building, but um, similar sort of idea. These are the uh, precast mock-ups and the, the lighting tests that uh, are done. The buildings are under construction at the moment. The last project is um, the Tampa Museum of Art. And um, the evolution of the art museum is an interesting um, project in architecture. And I think the poles are pretty distinct between the idea of an art museum as a work of art in itself and a, a beautiful sculptural object, or the art museum as a kind of instrument and a, a, a framework that allows the art itself to become the main part of the show. So obviously this um, follows the second uh, trajectory and um, it's a, in, a, in a floodplain um, in Tampa, Florida where the first 18 feet couldn't house any of the art programs. So there's a kind of glass pedestal on which this jewel box um, floats and the jewel box then gets filled with the art. One of the experiences that I had the first time I went to Tampa was that it was so hot that I had to wait for the sun to go down before I could go outside. So the first thing I said to myself was, I'm going to make shade. And so because the programs worked like this, I made this 40-foot porch, which um, overhangs the building. This is uh, the, the building over here. This is a famous... Um, Don Kiley Garden, and then this is a new park that has just been completed and a children's museum. So the interesting other aspect for me of art museums is that the collection of objects inherently means that you're going to run out of space. And every art museum that I know of gets added onto. But so many of the art museums are designed as sort of finite fixed objects that don't allow any future addition. So I instead worked with the idea of the mat building and set up an infrastructure where it would be very easy to continue to add on to the building. And um, in fact, I think they're almost getting to a point where they might have to. It happens quite quickly too. Um, but anyway, then there was the question of what the building should look like. And of course, I didn't want it to look like anything. But um, 
I wanted it to work like nature. And so there are two layers of perforated metal which are separated by um, six inches, which as you um, walk around create these moray patterns which are constantly flickering like water or sky. And so it very much embraces the kind of world that it's in as a, a kind of live object that, that that doesn't actually have to do anything. Uh, the, the curators of modern art museums don't want light or any kind of relationship to the exterior. They, want, they prefer neutrality and a controlled sort of world. So here's the um, overhang, which is this huge sort of urban porch, which has become a venue for great parties and weddings and stuff like that. And the downtown Tampa, which like many places is developing into a new urban kind of focus and people are starting to live there and the, the urban life is kind of like getting embraced. And just some views around the object. And the object itself um, and, and the interior, uh, the, 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 these dots became very interesting, like you can buy dot ties and dot napkins and dot, uh, the, the gift shop's full of dots now, so <laughs> I like that. Um, but, but they're all over in the building and they also turn into like skylights in the main kind of atrium. Um, this is the kind of itinerary, a very simple, simple path, because I, I also hate getting confused in public spaces, so it's very legible how to use this building and very easy to know where you are and where to go. This is a, a sculpture gallery which overlooks the river and um, the galleries themselves are completely neutral spaces. Um, they remind me of those um, Russian uh, snowstorm scenes in Dr. Zhivago where anything becomes important and that's sort of what I thought a gallery should be. So when the art's placed in it, it really becomes the foreground uh, and, and becomes very important. And then at night the uh, building um, turns itself inside out and between the two layers of perforated metal there's a LED array which um, becomes a kind of public art piece. And this is an installation by Leo Valori, the guy that did the Bay Bridge uh, installation. Um, and so uh, it has a sort of other role at night as, as this uh, object in the city. Um, I just want to end with um, one little thought, which is um, to sort of go back to the beginning. Um, and here you, you see the museum as a frame, an instrument rather than an object an open-ended and ambiguous, open-ended and ambiguous, abstract and free of agenda, expressing its own reality rather than an artistic um, impulse, where the actual materials and systems of assembly, the process of construction, are the expression. At a time when architecture is driven by novelty and spectacle, there's another much deeper foundation, ruled by evolution and refinement. My search is for new forms of expression which extend architecture's language and create expanded fields of freedom for its occupants. Thank you. housing in, in uh, Berkeley. Were you, a you were able to get these approved um, plumbing code, electrical code, by submitting the drawings originally and then getting the manufacturer to um, somehow get e each one of these m modules approved um, no matter where they were built? No, so there's actually for pre-manufactured housing and mobile homes, there's a separate state agency that performs 
the inspections at the manufacturing source. So they basically carry out the inspections. In the case of Berkeley, of course, they want to inspect them again. So we have two uh, sets of field inspection. You know, we have two sets of inspection. But the, the uh, primary inspection is actually a state agency that visits the plant and, and inspects at the plant. Everything's installed. You know, the electrical, the plumbing is all kind of installed. There are connections that have to be made in the field, but um, essentially it's all done in a factory. And, and how did you get the red and white colors approved there? That's a, a, the red and white colors in, approved in Berkeley. <laughs> That's another story. Um, <laughs> you know, um, Berkeley has a tradition of brown shingle. Um, it's very prominent in the fabric of Berkeley. And um, I, t I, I thought those were brown. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a product called Fundamax. Actually, honestly, in reality, they're more brown than this. They, they're being installed. I, I, I didn't um, download the pictures, but they're being installed right now, um, and, and they're a little more brown than the red. Um, when you're building in some of these large um, uh, urban areas, uh, do you take into account the uh, parking facilities uh, affiliated with your building? Or um I mean, parking is very rigorously controlled in every city. Mm -hmm. But do and you build? I mean, do you build a parking structure or parking facilities? For example, under the buildings, or well, in in Hollywood, there's 700 units <laughs> and there's 2,000 parking spaces because we have to replace the parking that was um, part of the open lot for Palladium use, as well as provide parking for all of the units. So there's a um, th the project is on um, Sunset Boulevard, but then there's a street behind called Selma and there's a above grade parking garage of seven levels in that area but it looks it's wrapped in the same um, material as the main building and then there's six levels below grade of parking as well so you know th this parking's a, a very interesting issue in San Francisco right now parking is discouraged in any of the projects that I showed you. In fact, the zoning only allows, as of right, 0.75 or 0.5 parkings per unit. That means if you buy a unit, you have to buy half a car, and you can park <laughs> your half car. But it's actually a very interesting reality, because if you look at the, the current situation, the the issuances of driver's license is declining. The kind of uh, demographic of young techie people who are living in the units that I'm building in San Francisco basically don't have cars. You know, I grew up in a world where, I mean, it was just part of manhood. You couldn't imagine growing up and not driving and having a car. Uh, a lot of young kids and like kids of my friends um, they don't even bother getting their driver's license. There's a very interesting shift going on. And San Francisco, which always makes lots of mistakes, at first I thought they were crazy, but I, I, I actually have, you know, we fin last year we finished four buildings in the city. They, all of them didn't have one-to-one uh, -one parking, and they've all been sold. So there's obviously, you know, like, a, uh, it works. People don't necessarily need cars. Personally, I have three parking spaces. <laughs> Where is the location of your synagogue in San Francisco? It's on Park Presidio, which is 14th, and Clement on the corner. It's, um, it's a very old synagogue that's been there since 1926. And... Um, yeah, this this has been there for quite a while. I think that's that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Merci. Non, non, non. Yeah. No, I mean, that was...